So I think we will go ahead and get started. So again, in the chat roll, there's a link to the program or the participant agenda. If you're just joining for the afternoon session, welcome. We're glad you're here. Feel free to name, add your name and affiliation to the chat roll. We're going to go ahead and get started again with the Buffer Summit. We had a great morning full of really you know, fascinating presenters from community-based social marketing to specific plants, what trees are being grown, what trees need to be grown, and we're really looking forward to the afternoon. And a lot of the afternoon sessions really directly tie into what we've heard from the morning. So we're looking forward to our sessions this afternoon. And I'm going to go ahead, Amber, and turn it over to you. And I think um, Amber is going to be doing a screen share. So Amber, I'll turn it over to you and uh, to introduce the session. Great. So Sierra, you might need to stop sharing, it looks like. Yeah. Let's see. And ribs and sausage gravy leftovers, Austin says in the, man, that's great. Every time we do the asking the food thing, I feel like we need to have a gigantic food meeting. People bring all the good stuff. All right. All right, so um, welcome back, folks. Uh, the next panel is Making Buffers Count, Dispelling the Myths and Sharing Tips for Reporting Projects. Um, it might sound like the not most exciting thing, but it's so exciting. Um, and I wanted to give some background on where this idea came from and just um, the purpose of the of the of this panel. So um, when I first started out planting buffers years ago, I knew they were awesome and I knew that they were part of the larger cleanup plan for the Chesapeake Bay. But admittedly, I really didn't think too much about how we were ultimately tracking that progress against those goals. Um, but as probably like many of you, as you start to do more projects and ask the questions, you realize how much energy is really going um, in behind the scenes to track our collective impact um, so that we can celebrate and see all the awesome work that's happening across the watershed. So our hope for the session is to first help you see how much the work you do matters, um, and to help dispel any myths around reporting projects. I know I believed a few things that ended up not being true. Um, introduce you to um, what the most co comprehensive reporting tool we have, which is um, in Virginia anyway, it's reporting to DEQ. Um, and hope that you'll leave thinking that it's reporting and verification isn't that bad and realize that you have colleagues to help you um, ask all the questions ask the things that you might think is a stupid question um, so to help us along this panel we have four folks that are going to be talking to you we have sally claggett with the u.s forestry service um, um, she's a liaison to the chesapeake bay program we have bill keeling uh, with the virginia department of environmental quality We've got Brian Hoffman with the Friends of the Rappahannock, just up north of the James. And we've got Judy O'Kay, um, who serves as a consultant for the Virginia Department of Forestry. And to get us started, though, I wanted to kind of bring it local because it can get a little bit like, you know, oh, we've got 70,000 acres to meet and it's just these gigantic goals. And sometimes it's hard to know what that means for you and your little neck of the woods. So I wanted to share um, a tool that we have on the consortium page. Let me get to that for you. So if you go to the website, jamesriverconsortium.org, there's an about section and resources, and we have this coordination tool. It's constantly being improved based on impact or input from folks, but I wanted to show you what all this whip progress and all of this stuff. So basically people report their work um, with the buffers they're doing in their area to Department of Environmental Quality. It goes into this model behind the scenes. And then um, as that information is processed, we're able, and actually you're able to access that too through um, CAST. So um, this, all of this information that you see on the screen is from that model. It only represents what's been reported. So if you did work and it didn't end up in here, then it's not going to show up. But this is the most comprehensive tool um, that reporting to the model that we have. So that's what we pull from. So on this page, um, watershed WIP is Watershed Implementation Plan. You can look at this information um, from different scales. So 
You can look at it by county scale. You can look at it by sub watershed. So there's a HUC 10, there's a HUC 12. And you could look at it based on what year. Right now we only have up to 2019. They're still processing 2020 um, numbers. And then you can look at what type of buffer. So again, people throw out these things. They say, oh, almost 70,000 acres of buffer are needed in the James. That's not just one type of buffer though. Um, it gets complicated, but we've tried to break it down. So you can view, if you're just interested in looking at uh, goals and progress for forest buffers on fenced pasture, you can select that. You could pick grass buffers on fenced pasture, which as you see, this is where a lot of our uh, soil and water conservation districts have been focused, getting those cattle fenced out. So I'll just land on that one. Um, and you can click on any of these and it gives you um, the completion, what the goal was, and what the percentage is towards completion. Um, so just sharing this so you can know that there's a tool out there if you're interested in seeing a little more detail about what's going on in your county or your area, uh, this tool is available and is pulled directly from what's reported. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, and we have two, oh, actually, I don't want to stop sharing because I'm going to introduce, oh, no, that's fine. So we have two polls. Uh, one is, um, you can launch the first one. So we're interested in knowing, again, there's no guilty feelings here. If you've done a buffer and you didn't report it, that's fine. Just, we want to know, kind of get a feel. So the first question is, have you planted a buffer at your organization? Maybe you didn't physically plant it, but were you part of making a buffer project happen? And then the second question is, have you ever reported or do you know if your organization reported that project to the Department, Department of Environmental Quality? And it's okay to say unsure and it's okay to say no. Great. So we'll give folks a, a few seconds to fill that out. There's a question in the chat roll from Sally. Does the, does the reporting tool work outside the James? Not at this point. Nope. But interested <laughs> in Sally, if there's an interest in other places, there's obviously opportunities to um, think about how that could be, if it would be useful to other areas. Great. And Emily Mills has provided a reply. Emily does great work with the Chesapeake Conservancy, and I'm sure we'd be happy to speak with partners as well. So yeah. we'll give it just a, a shout out. Chesapeake Conservancy is the group that um, helped develop that tool for us. And um, just so folks know, we are we do have funding to continue updating that tool through the end of 2024 through now. So um, that's good news. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Amber, sound good? Yep. Give folks another 10, one second. All right. So you can see the Results now? Let's see. So we've got about 64% of y'all have uh, planted a buffer. Yay, thank you for doing the good stuff. Um, and about 27, no. Um, have you ever reported to DEQ? So we've got no at 59% and yes at 27 and not sure 14%. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and good feedback. So we're gonna continue keeping those questions in mind. We're gonna hear from our panelists. And um, I think we have some questions at the end of this session to get at some of these things. Like if you haven't reported, you know, what are the barriers? What do you, you know, what are the things that are keeping you from doing so? So that we can um, make sure that the good work that you're doing is counting. So I will pass it to, I think Sally is first. Oh. Great. And just a reminder, if folks are in a place with background noise, we invite you to go ahead and mute yourself if you have background noise. And Sarah is going to be advancing the slides for presenters. So thanks again, presenters, for joining. We're glad you're here. And I'll turn it over to you, Sally. All right. Thank you all. It's great to see everyone and uh, be part of this day today. Um, uh, some people I haven't seen in a really long time. So I feel like a uh, it's, it's just a very nice warm group here. Um, so I, um, yeah, we're talking here about reporting and tracking and um, 
I'm of course coming from a watershed perspective. So um, I'm really glad that Amber shared the local reporting tool because um, you know, I've, I've, I've been doing this for quite some time and we've had various tools and I, I'm gonna touch on that a little bit, but what's really important is what works for you all and uh, what works for Bill Keeling. So, <laughs> so he's gonna be talking uh, to you next and, and uh, that's really gonna be very important. So um, just to get a perspective of uh, what we've been tracking at the Chesapeake Bay program, we usually start around 1996. And um, you can see our various goals here. We have a Chesapeake Bay Agreement um, 900 miles per year target, which is the lower dash line. And then we have the progress that is expected. Um, this is cumulative across the states in their watershed implementation plans. So um, these, and you've probably already said this many, many times, but we do have very ambitious goals we're trying to meet. And the um, history of the reporting is, is really quite interesting. There was an, an anomaly here in 2016 where uh, we had a survey done in Pennsylvania where a lot of particular, um, a lot of extra miles showed up there. Uh, this of course, 2002 is known as our best year, but um, maybe, uh, maybe the um, expectations of what was reported weren't as big. Um, and, and there's 20, 2019, which didn't get, isn't showing here, but it was 84 miles. And of course, 2020 has not been approved yet. Um, and, and so I was interested to hear that you will also in your local tool only have up to 19, 2019, and maybe Bill will touch on, on that. Um, next slide. I probably should hurry along here. So um, again, I just wanted to show across the watershed how this looks for, this is in particular ag riparian forest buffers and what is in the watershed implementation plans. And that is in orange. And then the blue bar shows what has been uh, um, accomplished to date. And you can see that, uh, well, let's jump over to Virginia, uh, you know, not really the highest here, but also the reporting is, is pretty far down there. And, um, you know, maybe there's uh, ways we can find some of those buffers if they were more done to move us up a little bit, but um, obviously a big gap to close in only a couple of years uh, left. So, uh, but not maybe the, the toughest challenge around. Um, so, uh, but uh, I did want to point out, so those are agri-apparian forest buffers. And if you want to go to the next slide, you'll see our urban riparian forest pro uh, buffer progress. So Virginia here is an outlier. Uh, we have a lot more urban riparian forest buffers are expected uh, or, or, or targeted as part of the watershed implementation plan. So that might be um, something that we focus in on, uh, you know, what's happening or where are we gonna get those? And also, have there been others reported? And, and, and again, you know, that tool, you can pick up maybe the urban uh, forest buffers, but um, also, um, and I don't know if Bill's gonna mention this, but what, what was done more than, like before the tool was developed, we, we, can, pick up, we can hopefully pick up some of those as well. We've, we've been trying to get better tools tracking urban canopy in general. So um, uh, hope we expect those to come online. <laughs> Uh, at some point. Next slide. Um, but uh, what's really important, and this was touched on during James Davis Martin's presentation, is we also have sort of to balance out the reporting aspect of, um, of buffers, is we have the new high resolution change data. So uh, between the years 2013 and 2018 19, we will find out what's happening uh, with our, our, our forest cover, uh, especially forest cover. And also that is gonna be combined with a new hyper resolution hydrography layer. So we'll be able to have the best buffer data that we've ever had. So we'll know, we'll have the best stream data that we've ever had. And then we'll also have the best change data that we've ever had. So we can see, yeah, we've had all these uh, buffers reported, but how much 
of a net gain are we getting or what kind of change are we seeing? So we're gonna be able to interpolate a lot of information and also um, you know, maybe we'll be finding more buffers in some counties that haven't been recorded. You know, There's all kinds of things that would happen, but going back to, I thought uh, James answered that question quite well this morning. We were talking about, I think ver verification at the time and Adrian Cotola had asked about, you know, well, what does it cost? And, you know, how are we going to catch up with our verification needs? And um, James Davis Martin said, well, you know, you know, we're looking forward to groups like this to help us figure that out. But also we have this new data for the whole watershed that we hope will be useful um, in order to help verify um, or, or, or have a role in verification of some sort. Um, in going forward. So this data should be available early next year. So be on the lookout for that. And we're working on um, not just county by county reporting out of tree canopy change, but also a baywide report on, on forestry change. Cause there's, there's a lot of, a lot we're seeing with change in forestry. Next slide. Um, and so at the Bay program, um, we have a big new effort called outcome attainability. And we, there's a group called the management board. And what they, they wanted to do is say, why aren't we seeing, like, where are we not seeing progress and on our important water quality goals and our important uh, Bay Agreement goals and why not? So that's something that's happening right now. Um, and what we found so far is that uh, buffers are one of the top goals that are unlikely to be met by 2025. And we are looking forward to hearing from the management board on what um, they think needs to happen as a result of our outcome attainability issues. Um, so it will be, um, it's, it's to be determined, but um, what's likely to happen is there's really going to be a, even more pressure for the states to really know what's happening on the ground and figure out, um, you know, uh, um, I guess, alternatives to, uh, you know, to be realistic about what they can do, can and can't do. But, um, but any, it's just one, I wanted to point out this outcome attainability because we're getting a lot new, a lot of new eyes on this issue, and it will involve reporting and tracking and verification and uh, all of the above. Great, Sally, one more minute. Oh, okay. Next, I think that might be all I have. Yes. So I don't need it. Great. Thanks so much, Sally. Let's thank Sally for such a. I love the the threads you wove together, Sally, from the earlier presentations. So. That's great. There is a question here. What happens if Virginia doesn't meet the goals? Sally, do you want to go ahead and address that briefly? And then we'll turn it over to Bill. That is a really good question from someone from Virginia. And I think maybe James Davis Martin. Um, you know, it, it's been discussed over the times. And it's and, and of course, we have to be clear what goal are we talking about? Is it, is it the TMDL or is it the buffer goal? So um, if it's the buffer goal, it's not the end of the world because presumably Virginia will make up for that using other BMPs. But if there's no other way to make up for that, um, then it's likely that the TMDL won't get won't be met. And that's a discussion happening at the management board level and the principal staff committee level and on up. But James Davis Martin and maybe Bill will will be able to um, tell you more about that. Great. Thanks so much, Sally. So I welcome additional feedback and comments in the chat roll if folks have it. So Sally, thanks. And we'll turn it over to Bill Keeling with the Department of Environmental Quality. Thanks again, Sally and Bill. Over to you. Hello, you. I hope you can hear me. Yep, um, we can hear you just fine. Okay. Uh, just wanted to show you the website and link to what we call the BMP Warehouse, which is the online reporting application. Um, it's, next slide, please. So it's uh, been de developed since 2015 and has been used to report the annual progress to the Bay Program since 2015. We're getting ready to submit uh, the 2021 progress submittal. As of August 25th, you can see we had over 300 users and over 570 listed organizations 
We're currently now at, at 1.18 million records, total imported records. I, I cannot give you the individual BMP count. Uh, right now, we're at a little over 265,000 records that will be submitted to Bay Program before December 1. And what we have for forested buffers reported throughout time is a, a little under 19,000 acres. And the difference between that number and what you saw in Sally's is, uh, presentation is probably explained by what the model world calls credit duration, or we would call lifespan in the real world. So if we reported a BMP say in 1985 and it has a 10-year lifespan and it does not get inspected and have a status of past that we can give to EPA, they no longer count that BMP after it's met its credit duration period. So that may explain part of the difference between what Sally's numbers are because that's what got credited in the model, not necessarily what was submitted by the state. And there's a difference. Next slide. Uh, the warehouse can collect BMP statewide. It's not just a day program, bay reporting thing. We collect 319 and water quality improvement fund grant reporting. MS4 report, uh, all phase twos have had to report for the last couple of years by using the BMP warehouse. We do report our annual progress through the application. Um, the deadline for getting data to us is the 31st or Halloween, October 31st. After that date, we cannot guarantee that the data loaded will actually get submitted to the Bay program because there's a lot we have to do to the data to make it ready. And I want to iterate that the warehouse is set up around a reporting organization, not individuals. And there are authorized users or individuals that have the ability to either view or write or overwrite, edit, load data. So it would depend on what you sign up for with the, the warehouse. Um, and I want to point out the reporting has to be non-duplicative of another organization's information. So if you're working in coordination with USDA and Virginia Ag Cost Share, Virginia D Department of Forestry, James River Association, Bay Foundation, on down the line, we have to make sure that none of these sources are reporting the same BMP implementation. That's part of the verification. We're supposed to report non-duplicative data where possible. Next slide. To give you an idea how the, the data flow goes from uh, the source where implementation occurs to the Bay program, the reporting entity or organization would upload their data into the warehouse using an Excel template. Then it's in DEQ's hands. Uh, there is this thing called NIEM, or the National Environmental Information Exchange Network. This is a basically a computer to computer, if you will, node system. So EPA has multiple nodes. Virginia DEQ has the Virginia node. So all of the data has to get loaded onto our node and then sent to their node to the exchange network. Once it's on the Bay program node, they have a set of software that then translates the NEAN information into CAST information or what the watershed model is called. The important thing here is the data may pass the NEAN validation but fail processing in CAST. So we have to sometimes go back and forth many different times in a circular effort in order to get everything as correct as possible. And we have a hard deadline of 12-1 of each year to have everything submitted and error-free, if possible, 
And what constitutes a progress year is shown here for the 21 progress year would be any implementation occurring from 7-1-2020 to 6-30-2021. That, that's the information that we provide each year as far as new records. And that's the end of my presentation. Hey, awesome. Thanks, Bill. It's so interesting to hear how the, these different things weave together. So there is in the um, a few questions. Judy has asked, can you go back years to report unreported projects? Say that again. Sure. So Judy asks in the chat role, can you go back years to report unreported projects? So retroactively reporting, I assume, Judy? Yes, Judy's yes. nodding. Yes, we, we can. All the time people are finding stuff that they did in the past, we report it as the date it was implemented. So if you found something done in 1982, we can report it if you have all the pertinent measures and what are needed to report. And that's kind of important because if you don't have all the information we need, we cannot pass it on. So in each BNP has its own list of specific measures and names and it's very particular that the NEAN, I will, I will say there's an easy way to scratch your elbow and there's a hard way. And the NEAN <laughs> is the hard way of doing it. <laughs> Even that acronym, NEAN, that's a hard acronym to pronounce. So thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Uh, join me in thanking Bill for a great presentation. Thanks, Bill. And folks, Brian's going to be coming up with the Friends of the Rappahannock in just a moment, but Emily's going to be putting a link uh, question rather in the chat role for each of you. One of the things that our panelists are curious about is what is the biggest barrier from preventing you from reporting your buffer projects? So you can see that question in the chat role. And then, um, Judy, I see there's a question from you there that maybe Bill can respond to in the chat role too. So what's the biggest barrier preventing you from reporting your buffer projects? Open it up to all of you to share your some responses to that question. I, are you asking me to answer that? Well, Bill, that's actually a question for everybody we're curious about to hear in the chat role about some of the, the biggest barriers to preventing people from reporting buffer projects. So people are just putting their responses in the chat role right now. And one of the things we're hearing is assuming that someone else was doing it. Yes, if the project is more than 10 years old, include dates for inspection. That's great. So we can continue to count that older projects through time. Any other barriers preventing you from reporting projects? Mm -hmm. Staff time for multi-year monitoring and verification, absolutely. Making sure as an organization we're prepared to verify it in 10 years, that's a lot of thinking ahead. All right, so feel free to continue adding, adding responses to that. With that, thanks again, Bill, for the presentation. We're gonna turn it over to Brian Hoffman with the Friends of the Rappahannock. Really looking forward to having you on board, Brian, and we'll turn it over to you. Thanks again, Bill. Thanks, Christine and Amber and everyone for having me here. Um, I'll start off with the caveat that I do not participate in the James River Buffer Consortium and I'm not pertinent, I'm not up to speed on all of the wonderful conversations that happen routinely. So forgive me if I am going over stuff that is already commonplace for y'all. Um, <clears throat> in addition to working for Friends of the Rappahannock, which is very similar to the James River Association, um, I'm, I coordinate the Rappahannock River Roundtable, um, which is a conglomeration of tons of organizations in the Rappahannock watershed and beyond, uh, focused on accelerating the pace of BMP implementation in the Rappahannock watershed. And it is very focused on WIP implementation, which we just heard a little bit about. And one of our priority BMPs is forest riparian buffers and tree planting in the agricultural and urban sectors. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed in all of our conversations with planning districts, uh, DEQ, and et cetera, is there's so much happening that we don't know about. And if we don't have the numbers, we can't accurately uh, say we're done or see how far we have to go. Um, so next slide. <clears throat> um, you can just click through. I think there's three or four. <clears throat> so. Friends of Rappahannock and our partners, um, we have a couple of different ways that's kind of business as usual for reporting. Um, 
the most common is not our problem. Uh, somebody else is doing that. <clears throat> and you have to really know that somebody else is going to do that. So you can be assured that if it is funded through the Virginia Agricultural Cost Share Program, DCR is getting those numbers and they give them to DEQ who runs them through that nice formula that you saw on the last slide. Um, <clears throat> similarly, um, <clears throat> if you are given a grant through the Department of Forestry, their uh, clean, Trees for Clean Water grant or the Urban Community Forestry grants, um, you have to report the data back to them and DOF will give the data to DEQ in an annual report of all of their projects. Um, and then DEQ reports them to the Bay Program. <clears throat> um, if you work with the Natural Resource Conservation Service on an EQIP or a CREP or CSP project, um, again, they are going to be the ones reporting it to the Bay Program upon completion not the NGO or the contractor who's out there putting the trees in the ground. Um, and then it gets a little bit more complex with um, non-point source 319 grant funded projects. Uh, there's a separate spreadsheet to go into the BMP warehouse for that. And ultimately you're responsible for reporting those directly to DEQ through their TMDL um, program. But again, not the necessarily the responsibility of the NGO, it's whoever holds that 319 grant. So talking about in the NGO world, we get private grant funding, landowners hire us outside of some of these um, programs to just go out and plant a buffer. There may not be an official contract with a state or federal agency. And this is where, where you report them. Um, both JRA, Friends of the Rappahannock, CBF, all kinds of groups. We all have a lot of money from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And a lot of that goes towards planting forest riparian buffers and they have this program called Field Doc. Not going to go into the myriad problems I have with that tracking app. However, they require you to report every project that you um, it, use their money to install. Eventually, my understanding is it goes from NIFWIF to the state WIP reporting agency, in this case, DCR, who then reports it to DEQ and back to the Bay program. Um, that's my understanding uh, about six years of doing that. And Amber is saying it doesn't happen quite yet, but that's how it's supposed to. Um, <clears throat> I would pitch to James or Amber or other folks if we should simultaneously be reporting to the BMP warehouse and NIFWIF, because a big thing I wanted to highlight in this is double reporting just causes headaches for everyone um, and really make sure, okay, well, I guess I don't fully understand it how Nicholas is reporting. That's what this whole session's about. Um, <clears throat> so I, I guess I can go back and re report all of our NIFWIF reported stuff, um, or I could just ask Jake Riley to uh, expedite that reporting to the Bay program. So um, we had identified that there's some reporting gaps for places that aren't NIFWIF funded and not with some of these state or federal tree planting projects. And Again, something that folks don't necessarily like on the full Chesapeake Bay program scale is everyone creating their own little thing. If there's a way to uh, capitalize on an existing program or come together to create something larger that we can all share, they tend to like that. So next slide. <clears throat> um, we uh, partnered up with the Virginia Department of Forestry. I think that was two slides. Uh, can we go back one? <clears throat> The Virginia Department of Forestry was kind of having a similar idea when the Rappahannock River Roundtable was, and they decided they were going to create a voluntary tree tracking module of some sort to crowdsource tree planting data. Um, and they piloted it in the Rappahannock River watershed and the city of Virginia Beach. Um, and basically one tree planted counts as 144 square feet of land conversion whether that's urban, in a buffer area, out in the middle of a field, you, the model will, cap, will capitalize on that. So all those people who go to Lowe's or Home Depot or their local nursery and plant two redbud trees in their backyard, no one is getting credit for any of that. And that's at a land, an individual private landowner's expense. So we, Virginia needs that to meet these huge goals, especially in our urban areas. So how can we take advantage of that? 
in the chat, we've been seeing the requirements for it to count in the model. Um, so we created a voluntary input form where you know, you, we, we attach QR codes to our free trees we give away or the ones we sell. And we work with local nurseries to get this QR code. So a landowner could be like, I love the bay. I'm going to retract my tree. Well, <clears throat> before COVID, the goal was all of that voluntarily input data comes to someone like Friends of the Rap Panic. And we work with master naturalists, tree stewards, and other folks who have received training to go out into their community and verify those trees were planted correctly, slap, verify the GPS coordinate. And at that point, DOFs would send a batch to DEQ, just like they would do normally. And we get to track all of those trees. So these two links here, the first link um, is what you might see as a landowner um, to input your trees. I don't know if we're able to look at that first form. Yeah, I can do that. Let me pull it up. I'm gonna have to stop share and open the other screen. <clears throat> Brian, just about one minute left, quick heads up. Okay, well, um, this is not, um, then you go to add your trees. Um, yeah, this is the inspector form that you have to be trained in some fashion in order to go out and inspect a tree and for DOF to count those. We do want to make sure this is efficacious data going to the Bay program. Um, this is not limited to the pilot areas. If you want to start throwing these this program out, talk to Laura Johnson at Department of Forestry after she gets back from maternity leave. Um, and the My Trees Count tab, which is the other one, um, and you go to Add Your Trees, it's the third tab there on the top. Yep. So any landowner, or if you worked with an elementary school to plant six trees, you can add them in here as a, a, an NGO, um, as a landscaper, um, things of that nature. And it's pretty straightforward. It's survey one, two, three based. It goes in and D, uh, DOF is the ultimate one who gets the data. Um, so all of your subpartners and folks enter your data here and eventually there will be a backlog that needs to get verified. You can work with your local Department of Forestry, um, area forester, or if you have local tree stewards, the, that can be your boots on the ground workforce to go out and verify. If you wanna make it an official program, I highly recommend that you host a training so that you know every person received the same comparable training, not just like, I was an ISA forester 50 years ago, I'll go out and verify your trees. Um, anyway, this is an incredible resource that post COVID when we can really start bringing it to scale, I think is gonna be essential to capitalizing on all that data that individual landowners are paying for on their own. And I wanna see a huge spike across the state once this thing starts happening. So um, <clears throat> that's pretty much what I got. I wanted to throw this out there and highlight that for DOF as a potential new resource for everyone in the Commonwealth. Great. Thanks so much, Brian. I love the robust tools and questions that are happening both in the presentations, chat roll, and online. So everyone join me in thanking Brian for a great presentation and new tools to explore. And Judy, I think that Bill's added some info to your question in the chat roll here, um, which is which is great. And thanks again, Brian. And Judy, we'll turn it over to you. Judy OK, he's a consultant to the Department of Forestry. And uh, over to you, Judy. I'm, thank you very much. It's great to be here and great to see this happening. I know this case came up at one of our chat sessions with the James River Group and you know it's good to see it happening so thanks everybody. Um, I saw, thought I'd go back and just look at some of the cliches that we all say and see how they'd apply to what we're doing and so my first one is to begin with the end in mind because if you really want um, a good project you have to start in the beginning you have to um, start with the site that you've picked you have to look at the characteristics of that site and once you've got that down patch, you need to um, look into like how many trees you need and things of that sort. But um, mainly know that you can get into the site. If you have a stream crossing, how you're gonna get across and um, what it looks like on the other side. You know, what's the aspect? Um, is, it, is it a sun side? Is it a shade side? You know, those types of things. And always start with a reputable plant source. I mean, 
I have seen people dig up plants in West Virginia and market them in my neighborhood. And uh, that just doesn't cut it. You know, you need something that you know has a total root system and uh, your state nurseries are really good for that. Uh, sometimes, you know, they, they can't keep up with the um, numbers that are needed. So you have to go outside, but if you go outside, make sure sure you're dealing with the natives people and make sure the nursery can actually give you what you're asking for and they're not giving you cultivars of or something of that sort. So make sure that you've got a good plant source and uh, start early. If you don't start early, like start in November if you're planning on planting next spring because otherwise you're gonna be out of luck because everybody sells out really fast. And another thing you need to look at at the beginning is who your planters are. It could be anybody that you choose. It could be groups that volunteered. It could be old people, young people. You need to look at that. And if you start by planning smarter, you won't have to work quite as hard when it comes to um, looking at your maintenance for later. And I've got some tips on that on my last slide. And then um, if you really want to count, you know, towards the Bay program, one of the things that you can assure yourself is if you follow the cost share protocols, like what are they asking for a CREP project? You know, how many trees per acre? Uh, diversity of species. What do they want you to end up with in the end? Even though it's not a cost share project, if you treat it like a cost share project and build it like a cost share project, it is almost bound to be successful and to count. Next slide, please. Whatever's worth doing is worth doing well. And these are old words, as you can see, it was an Earl of Chesterfield in 1774. It has not changed. It really is true. If you want to end up with something good, you have to do it well. So start with site prep. If you think that site prep just means you go out, you look at the field and you um, kind of cut a little grass, that may be good in some places. In other places, you may have to look at invasives. You have to make sure you know what they are. And it just may be grass competition that's gonna come back unless you mow and mow. So you may need to use a little bit of herbicide. Make sure you get the right person to do that. The other thing is plan the right tree for the right place. I said something about aspect before, and I said something about slope. I didn't say anything about moisture. And there's different moisture requirements. When you go into a forest and you look, you say, oh, this is an old hickory forest. The land is, you know, it's kind of drier soils and it's, um, you know, the oaks will come up in a bit of understory and they're usually not your first species that grows usually get things like maple and sweet gum and things like that, depending on your soil moisture. So, you know, make sure you put the right trees in to begin with. Um, we do have a lot of trouble with the oaks unless they get a lot of attention. And so if you're going to plant oaks, you're, you're going to need to really take care of them. If you're going to plant others that are kind of like the weed plants like sycamore and red maple and that type of plant, you don't have to work quite as hard at it. And always remember the shade factor. Try to not plant, if it isn't an understory plant, like some of the shrubs, or not shrubs, but smaller trees are, don't plant it under the canopy of a large tree. You know, that's a bad thing to do. So I said something about your helpers. Who's gonna plant the trees? Who's gonna dig the holes? If you're dealing with children, like scouts, always have parents, join up with them because otherwise your holes are not gonna be big enough and you're gonna be doing a lot of J rooting and shallow rooting. If you need to do the holes ahead of time because you don't have the adult help, augers aren't bad. You just don't wanna do it when the soil's real wet because then it becomes like cement against the sides of your hole and you have to go back in and chop that away. So that's more work. So make sure that if you're gonna do that kind of thing that you do it right. Um, it's usually, Augers generally work well if your soil is very rocky and you have you know, young planters or older planters because um, you can make the holes bigger with an auger because if you hit a stone, the stone comes out and then you've got soil you can work with and you can work away at it with the augers. And I'm talking about gas powered augers that have a um, probably a six inch bit on them. So um, if you don't have one and you wanna invest in one, you know, look into it, make sure you get the right kind. 
um, number of trees per acre. And that was one of the things I was trying to get Bill and, and James Martin to say is, you know, what are your expectations here? But I guess it doesn't matter what your expectations are if you start out with the right number of trees per acre. If you wanna end up with 200, 250, you're probably gonna to have to plant 300, maybe even a little more than 300, depending on what your site is like. Because you wanna have, with your cost share programs, they ask for 60 to 70% survival. And so at the end of 15 years, you're hoping that you have that survival. At the end of five years, you hope that survival. It depends on how you have worked with your site as to what you're going to end up with. So that's why I say whatever's worth doing is worth doing well. And to look at all the steps you need to take pre-planting to make sure that it's going to work out. Okay. One minute, Judy. Yep. One, one minute. Okay. Um, next slide, please. This is my last slide. And there's some things on here I want to explain a little bit about, but um, you don't know the hand you're going to get dealt. You learn to take life as it comes to you. And I don't know how many of you saw the Titanic, but this is what Jack says when he's talking to the higher up people that, you know, the stuffy people and what, what he's doing on the boat and whose friends he is. Well, he, he didn't know what life was going to deal to him either. And he ended up in the water hanging onto a, onto a board. But, <laughs> and sometimes that's what you feel like. <laughs> so um, what you want to do is when you put it in, Make sure you try and think ahead a little bit, you know, have that life jacket on already and um, protect the damage that you might get from wildlife. And that would be through using fencing or using uh, shelters. A lot of people don't like shelters, but there's a place for them for sure because it does help with the deer and it even helps after they're up and out of, out of the shelter to maybe cut the shelter and protect the tree from deer rub buck rub and um, those types of things. So in voles, if, if you've got voles in your field, they love the grassy places to hide. They'll get under your shelter, get into the roots and your tree is dead and you don't even know it. You go in there, you touch it and it comes right out of the ground. So make sure you take care of those things and protect from that kind of damage. You can, there's repellents for voles. Um, if you mow regularly, the grass isn't there, they can't hide in it. And so you get rid of them that way. And then look at your invasive plants. You know, invasive plants don't go away in a year. Some of them have a seven year seed bank. And so one year isn't gonna take care of it. Just because you pulled it out doesn't mean it's not coming back. So check on that regularly. And also um, signage. If, if you look at the middle of the slide, it says, please don't disturb the plants. Shoreline restoration in progress. This was put in a neighborhood where the kids are messing around with the shelters and the plants and things like that. And they put these signs up and the kids finally got it and left them alone. And I think that that was one of our master naturalist plantings. And it was the idea of the fellow that was doing it. If I put some signage up, it'll really help. These kids are teenagers, they'll listen. So there you go. Um, your maintenance plan. I've, I've mentioned all of these things. I, I think you, you know, if you take that to heart, you're generally gonna have a pretty successful planting. Um, monitoring, and a lot has been said about monitoring today. If you don't monitor, if your 15 years is up and you don't go back and look at it again and get it renewed, it's, fallen out of the, it's falling out of the system. So what you need to do is go in there and verify. And people say, I don't have time, we don't have staff, well, Photo verification is good. You know, if you've got somebody, then just go out and take pictures and somebody else can interpret them. That will help. If you look up in the upper left, there's a tube that has yellow and black painting on it. And I found this at the scout um, planting that we had down at the Albert um, Scout Reservation in Chesterfield County. And what they did was red maple gets red, sycamore gets yellow, Black and yellow meant locusts. They gave a color to each plant. So as the person going by, even if they couldn't identify the tree, the color told them what was in that tube or not in that tube. And I thought that was great. And I found this to be very helpful because we started this little program where we're taking a drone out and doing inventories. Because if you don't have staff, but you've got somebody that can run a drone, Drones can do the work twice as fast as you can do the field work. You're plowing through the field with the briars and things like that. It's going above and it's looking down and you can do it at 10 feet, look into the shelter and see if there's something there or not. You may not be able to identify it, but you'll know dead or alive. And that's an important thing. You can also see regeneration with it. 
It's very good for regeneration. You can identify a regeneration in most cases. And um, other things we're finding is we could see the nets that were left on and the trees were all bundled up in it. Another thing about nets, some of the fields we've gone to for inventory, the nets are laying and blown all over. One smart person at uh, Powhatan State Park stapled the net to the shelter and you can get it off when you need to, but it doesn't blow off on its own. And that is a really good tip because you, you can make a lot of, um, you know, just land pollution with these nets blown around. They don't go away quickly. So I think I'll learn from other people and we've got this green side up and that's a little um, statement about putting your plant in the ground right. You put the green side up, the roots down and um, it's a planting guide for working with volunteers and setting up plantings and you can get it electronically. Um, Virginia Department of Forestry, Laura Johnson has copy. The master naturalists have electronic copies of this. And it's a nice little document to kind of help you get started if you've not done this before. So I'm just encouraging you to, you know, do it right the first time. Think about the, what you're gonna end up with, what you wanna end up with, because in 15 years, you should have a forest on that land. And that's what everybody's looking for. That's what the Bay needs. And that's what Virginia needs for its TMDL. So get it in the ground, do it right and report it. Thank you very much. Great, awesome. Thanks so much, Judy. What a great panel. Everyone, please join me in, in thanking our panelists for just really a, a excellent presentation across the board. You can find the reactions button or otherwise. So thank you. We've had obviously some inspiration for drones, for some potlucks, for roasted root veggie pizza from earlier discussions. So thanks everyone, as well as some really robust conversation about reporting and the difficulties and opportunities and challenges. And so it seems to me like a follow-up conversation is likely going to be needed for this um, as well. So that's going to help inform our programming moving into 2022. So thanks everyone for that. So thank you again, presenters. I'm going to turn it over to Amber to introduce Dr. Dabala. All right. So um, I know we're a little behind, but we've got such great discussion and things. So welcome um, for our next panel, or actually our keynote. Um, it'll just be one speaker on this one. Uh, buffers with benefits, carbon, biodiversity, and partnerships. And we have a special guest, guest calling in from California, Dr. Kristen Dabala. And um, just a quick overview of what this panel, our speak, speaker is going to be talking to us about is um, this idea of multiple benefit conservation. Um, so this idea that um, our conservation efforts can simultaneously benefit local communities, um, enhance ecological function and improve quality for fish and wildlife, um, the restoration and conservation of uh, riparian ecosystems and buffers are prime candidates for providing multiple benefits. Um, for example, uh, riparian restoration has enormous potential to sequester carbon, support climate change mitigation goals, while also supporting biodiversity goals, water quality, and even community engagement. So we're super excited to have her, and um, she's from Point Blue Conservation Science in, in California. So welcome, Kristen, and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Amber. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, and, and yeah, th thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you all today. Um, I'm happy to share with you our work and our thinking about multiple benefit conservation. You kind of got a preview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, multiple benefit conservation in riparian buffers and riparian ecosystems specifically. Um, and also, I'm, I'm excited to hear from you uh, what you're thinking about these kinds of things. Um, this is a photo of a newly planted restoration site in Marin County, California, just north of San Francisco where the primary goal is improving water quality downstream in San Francisco Bay. Um, but of course, we recognize that there may be, may be many other benefits to restoration projects like this. Um, so uh, before I get into that, I wanted to give you, I wanted to start with a little bit of background about Point Blue and where I'm coming from so that you, you kind of understand uh, how we approach this. Um, so Point Blue Conservation Science is a nonprofit science organization based in California. Um, we do, we conduct international conservation research ranging from Alaska to Peru, um, the Sierra Nevada mountains in California out to sea, and uh, we even have some folks in Antarctica right now working on Adelie penguins. Uh, our mission is to work to advance the conservation of birds, other wildlife, and ecosystems 
through science partnerships and outreach. And to that end, we, we work in partnership with government agencies, uh, universities, other conservation organizations around the world to conduct research. We help and plan, uh, help plan and implement projects and, um, and also monitor results. And we also have our own in-house habitat restoration teams and education programs. We were originally founded as the Point Reyes Bird Observatory, uh, where we focused really entirely on bird conservation, but we've expanded a lot since then. And um, as for me, um, that's where I'm coming from too. I'm a wildlife ecologist. Um, so this is me in about 2004, just starting out, learning how to capture, handle, uh, handle birds and collect critical data on birds, um, ranging from on the right, that's the red-tailed hawk um, uh, on a very windy day. Um, and uh, on the left is a Stellar's Jay, um, and even down to, you know, we work with hummingbirds as well. Um, and so with all of this work, we are collecting data to track how bird populations are changing over time, how they're responding to things like habitat restoration, um, and also climate change impacts. And so through these experiences, I really found my career and my passion in conservation research. And, uh, and I also learned how bird populations can be really great indicators of environmental conditions of the ecosystems they rely on. And a question we often get is how are the birds doing? <laughs> um, and it's not, the answer is not well. You may have seen these results come out just a couple of years ago. Um, this big study that found that since 1970, there are an estimated 2.9 billion fewer birds, billion with a B, um, we think largely due to habitat loss, degradation and fragmentation. And that's just the last 50 years. Uh, and so if birds are indicators of ecosystem condition, um, you know, the proverbial canaries in the coal mine, uh, we know this is not just birds. Um, there's real concern worldwide about the loss of biodiversity and habitat and growing uh, interest and, um, uh, yeah, interest and momentum around conservation and restoration efforts to reverse these trends. And this is true in California as well, um, a major focus has been riparian ecosystem restoration, particularly in the Central Valley. And I'll kind of orient you, you, this is a, a map from a conservation planning document, so you can ignore a lot of these polygons, but um, this is San Francisco right here. Um, and this, this large flat area is the Central Valley. It's kind of a, a giant bathtub ringed by, ringed by mountains. This is the Sierra Nevada and then our coast range here. Um, and there's you know, several large rivers that drain out of the mountains. They meet in the delta here and flow out through San Francisco Bay. Uh, and the, the bright green you can see on here is the estimated extent of historical riparian vegetation in the Central Valley, so from around 1850. And there are some, uh, I promise, there are some very, some dark green specks you can barely see um, scattered throughout that is the current extent of riparian vegetation. So we estimate over 95% has been lost, uh, really converted to ag and urban. And um, since the 80s, there's really been a significant effort to restore right brain vegetation, especially, especially along the Sacramento River in this area. Um, and Point Blue has a long history of helping to support those efforts and study the wildlife response. And we know that birds respond quickly and well to riparian restoration, which is great. So this is a graph showing the change in bird species richness with the age of the restoration project over time. Um, and this is combined for a bunch of different restoration sites along that Sacramento River. And so our assumption all along has been that if birds are responding well to efforts like these, um, then we hope also the ecosystem health is improving. And so there are probably many other benefits being provided by this restoration. And we wanted to be able to understand and talk about these other benefits because, um, you know, I know not everyone is going to be motivated by bird conservation or see how that's relevant to them. Uh, there are many other potential benefits of riparian conservation and restoration. And this is a cartoon illustrating some of these. Um, but what was kind of frustrating is that we were always talking about these other benefits in a really vague way as sort of the potential uh, for improvements in you know, everything from water quality to um, fish habitat, stream temperatures, um, and more recently, carbon storage and improvements to the health and well-being of local communities. And so um, over time and over you know, the course of my career and in Point Blue, as we've been kind of talking about these ideas, our thinking has really grown first to, wouldn't it be great if we could measure all of these things and really quantify the full 
comprehensive value of a riparian restoration project and to be able to make a better case for why it's worth investing in these projects. And from there, we took it a step further to, wouldn't it be even better if we could intentionally design our restoration projects to provide multiple benefits? What would that look like? Uh, would the designs be different than what we're already doing right now? Uh, what should the multiple goals be? And also, who should be involved in defining those goals that maybe we're not working with yet? So these are not, um, certainly not just my ideas or Point Blue's ideas. They've been around for a long time in different forms. Uh, but there was a new term floating around that we kept hearing more and more, which is this multiple benefit conservation idea. And it hadn't been clearly defined and was getting used in different ways. And so uh, last year, we, we published a paper where we proposed a definition for multiple benefit conservation. Um, and that is uh, conservation efforts designed to simultaneously benefit local communities of people, enhance ecological function, and improve habitat quality for fish and wildlife. And so the idea is that multiple goals are defined at the start of a project, and then the project is specifically designed to achieve them all together. And this is in contrast to what a lot of folks were trying to do, which is really, um, you know, they had one primary goal, but they thought, oh, there might be some desirable kind of side effects or co-benefits. Um, so this is more intentionally, let's define those multiple goals from the start. And we um, describe what we saw as several strengths of this approach. One is, um, like I said, it's not an entirely new concept, but we think a constructive evolution of existing approaches like win-win conservation and ecosystem services that you, you may have heard about before. Um, we think it can be more inclusive of multiple worldviews and values in that goals can span a broad spectrum of ecological and social benefits, reflecting the values of the local community. And goals can be defined in terms of their own metrics. So they could be defined in terms of you know, number of birds for bird species or um, uh, you know, water quality benefits. They don't have to be framed in terms of an economic value, a common kind of currency across these benefits. Um, and that was something I was seeing more and more people trying to do and something I and, you know, and I know many others uh, find deeply uncomfortable when it comes to assigning a value to nature. Um, we think it's probably a more easily communicated concept relative to other terms like ecosystem services that can sound a bit more jargony. Um, it's also solutions oriented in that multiple goals are defined at the outset of a project, encouraging collaboration and hopefully daylighting trade-offs and synergies among goals. And we think it can be compelling. So we expect that this approach can create opportunities for more innovative partnerships and collaborations, potentially new funding sources, and, um, and help conduct more innovative projects. So uh, this is a really appealing concept to me, uh, but of course, much easier said than done. And um, you know, the question is, how do we take this concept from a sort of philosophical ideal to something more real, something we can really do? And how can communities be empowered to collectively define their multiple goals, to understand the synergies and trade-offs among those goals and make collaborative decisions that help achieve those goals? So um, I'm going to quickly walk you through some of the projects we've been working on to support these ideas. Our first step was to try to document some of these benefits. So how strong is the evidence for them? How large might these benefits be? Um, we started with carbon because we, we are very concerned about climate change and because of the growing conversations about the role of restoration in uh, restoration of natural lands in contributing to climate change mitigation. Um, and this, uh, these are a couple of images from the United Nations. Uh, you may have heard they just launched the Decade on Ecosystem Restoration to draw attention and build momentum for this idea that restoration can address both climate change and biodiversity conservation. And you see, these are a couple of uh, kind of social media images that they put out, one for forests and one for rivers and wetlands. And this is a common thing. We feel like riparian forests, which are both forests and wetlands, are often falling in the gap between um, and left out of these conversations. So we wanted to see where riparian forests fall in the potential for carbon storage. Uh, and so to start, we compiled data from all over the world and used it to model how much carbon on average is stored in riparian forests. And we found that carbon stocks in riparian forests just in the trees 
rival that of any other biome. The blue bars are our estimates for riparian forests from four different climate zones around the world. So it matters if you're in a you know warm and wet kind of tropical place versus a sort of warm and dry place. I think California falls into this one, um, but uh, uh, but still very high values. The gray bars are um, other estimates from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And we also found that planting riparian trees accelerated the process. So here I'm showing you how, uh, how much carbon stock increased over the first 10 years of forest growth. So kind of just that initial growth and establishment period. The green bars are for naturally regenerating riparian forests. So these are places that were recovering from a disturbance uh, like a fire or a flood. And the pink bars are forests that had been actively planted as part of a restoration. And so uh, not surprisingly, the planting, planting trees jump-started the forest growth and the initial growth rates were more than double. Um, now it doesn't necessarily mean that you end up with more carbon once the forests are mature. Uh, just, uh, you know, the naturally regenerating forest will probably catch up, um, but it does get things going faster. So this is um, what I've shown you so far is just in the trees. In the soil, we found that soil carbon on average more than triples as riparian forest is restored or recovers. It is a much slower process. It can take over 100 years to reach that value, um, but it's a much larger increase than had previously been estimated. So our research provides good evidence that riparian forests do sequester carbon. And, um, and we think that restoration could be a good strategy for carbon sequestration, particularly when you consider all of those other potential benefits to wildlife and ecosystems. Um, but there is a concern around the world that if carbon storage is your primary goal, forest planting projects designed to maximize carbon may not always be good for biodiversity. So um, for example, there's concern from people who work in grassland and prairie ecosystems that a focus on planting trees everywhere is not always the best strategy. So we need to, we need to be considering the trade-offs. Um, and that's true in riparian forests as well. So um, for a, a riparian restoration project, if we had goals of both providing habitat for riparian birds and sequestering carbon, how strongly are those goals related to each other? And are there trade-offs here? Um, and do we need to tweak the design of the restoration project to meet both goals? So uh, we conducted a field study Again, this is in the, the Central Valley of California at the Cosumnes River Preserve. And here, uh, the floodplains are very wide and have been mostly converted to ag, um, but some of the oldest remnant riparian forest is in this preserve. The, this orange plot here is a remnant forest that we estimate to be at least 80 years old, and the blue and green plots next to it are um, some well-established restoration sites that are 20 to 30 years old. So Point Blue has been conducting research in the preserve since the mid 90s. And we went back specifically to look at this question of how birds and carbon are related to each other. And so we compared these three mature forests to a baseline site further upstream that was just in the beginning stages of restoration. And just for a visual comparison, here is the baseline site on the left, uh, which was a former cornfield and mostly devoid of any woody vegetation. And on the right is the mature remnant forest uh, with an extremely dense canopy and understory. It was very difficult to walk around in there. <laughs> um, so by surveying the bird community and estimating the carbon stocks in each of these areas, we found, you know, again, not surprisingly, that having any riparian forest at all was better than none. Uh, the densities of riparian birds were three times higher in all of the restoration sites compared to the baseline. And there were large increases in carbon stocks as well. Um, so on one level, yes, there is a synergy between carbon storage and bird habitat goals, but we also found that forest structure matters. And so here is, um, it's kind of a 3D graph showing forest density on the y-axis, the vertical axis. So the number of trees per unit area and the shrub cover uh, or understory cover is on the horizontal x-axis. And the color, is showing you the predicted carbon stock at each combination of forest density and shrub cover, with yellow being the highest and purple the lowest. Um, the white dots are our spe more specific sampling locations, um, the combinations that we observed through the preserve. So what this is telling you is that if all we cared about was maximizing carbon, 
we would want a lot more trees than they have in most places in the preserve. And we wouldn't care how much shrub cover there was. It didn't affect carbon stocks. We might not bother planting any. Uh, but the same graph for bird abundance looks very different. Uh, they seem to prefer more open, less dense forest, fewer trees, more understory. So, you know, again, if we only cared about birds, we would recommend designing restorations with a high shrub cover, maybe ensuring the forest doesn't get too dense. So what this means is that uh, we also have some evidence for a trade-off here. We can't get the yellow, the high values, the highest maximum values for both carbon and birds at the same time in the same place. And so how the riparian restoration projects are designed and managed has a real impact on how much of each benefit we get. So um, this research is really just the tip of the iceberg, uh, just considering birds and carbon for now. Um, but the idea and hope is that this kind of information can help support planning and implementation of multiple benefit conservation projects. And just for a very, very simplified example of how we might use this kind of information, um, let's say we're discussing a plot of land, or maybe it's an entire watershed, and we're considering a couple of different restoration designs or conservation plans. And we have, um, if we just have two goals so far of carbon storage and riparian bird habitat, we expect the different designs will increase both, um, but how much depends on the, the specific design of the project. Um, you can imagine incorporating additional goals, keep adding, um, each of which might have different trade-offs or developing more of the more alternate scenarios, which might do a better job of meeting all of these goals. Um, and, you know, and again, we can extend this to larger landscapes um, and kind of more complicated uh, options or scenarios. But the idea here is to help a community um, or a partnership collectively understand where the synergies and trade-offs are um, and which scenarios help achieve multiple goals. And um, this is not at all meant to be a one-way street where a scientist comes in and tells you what your goals should be. Um, I, I really have a vision and you know, kind of the way Point Blue works in partnership of um, supporting, supporting partnerships. Um, so helping community members, partners come together to collectively identify their goals, develop and consider these, these alternate scenarios and ultimately make decisions together. Uh, and that the role of you know, experts and scientists I see is in helping to provide the supporting information and analyses about how much we expect each scenario will contribute to their goals. And then also helping to study the outcomes and kind of feeding back into that, that process. Um, because ecology and really these are you know, social ecological systems, they're complex and it's tough for anyone to understand or be able to intuit changes in all of these multiple dimensions at once. Um, so we, we all have our own perspectives and knowledge bases. And um, you know, I think it's helpful to find ways to share our information and help everyone get on the same page. So I'm gonna wrap up. Um, I've talked mostly about birds and carbon, but these same concepts can be expanded to or extended to other goals. Um, and there will likely be goals that aren't compatible with each other uh, in the same time at the same place. But, um, but I think there are still opportunities to you know, if we as a community decide both are important, can we propose a scenario that holds space for both of them in different places? Um, again, I recognize this is not easy stuff, but I feel like this is a positive and useful way forward um, to develop creative new partnerships with each other and help achieve multiple goals. So um, thanks so much for listening and for the invitation to speak to you today. And I hope it's been somewhat helpful um, to, to hear how we're thinking about multiple benefit conservation. And um, if you're not already, I would encourage you to consider how uh, these concept, concepts may be useful to you. Um, so if there's time, I'd be happy to take questions uh, and also to hear from you. It's always great to learn from partnerships like yours. Yeah, absolutely. Christy, great presentation across the board. So helpful to come back up to a high level to think about conservation connections why we do this, um, this work. So really key. Um, Christy, I wanna ask you something we're gonna be asking our, um, in our next panel folks, and we have a minute or two for questions. So if, if folks do have questions, feel free to put them in the, the chat roll. You alluded to this, Christy, but what is the greatest gift or value that you can bring to a partnership? And what was a collaborative experience that um, made, was successful for you? You alluded to that a little bit in terms of the influence of science and capacity of science. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah, I, I see our role. It's so funny. You know, we we started as a you know bird conservation organization, and as we've grown and extended, we we've, we've kind of had to, uh, you know, lean into sort of. Uh, areas that we're less comfortable with and sort of learn, you know, like I'm, you know, spent a, a couple of years diving into the world of carbon. Um, we've also more and more been, been on this, uh, been in this role of supporting partnerships and helping to um, uh, get a group of people to work together. So, so we've been kind of on this, this role of strategic planning in a way. Um, we've done a number of what we call climate smart restoration workshops. And this is Another angle I didn't get into today, um, but working with uh, a team trying to design a restoration project to uh, really clarify what their goals are, what their objectives are, and then go through a process of understanding what are the vulnerabilities to climate change of their goals, of their restoration project, of their design. How can we, you know, what are some ideas we have for addressing those vulnerabilities? Um, so, uh, you know, for a wildlife ecologist with, a, you know, a, a large, you know, a long history of working in the field and then also doing a lot of data analyses, all of a sudden we're learning how to facilitate workshops. Um, and it's been a really great uh, learning process for me. And, um, and I think, you know, I think there is an important role there just to help kind of facilitate those conversations. And once you get used to trying to get a group to like, really like, what are your goals? Like, let's, let's write them down, let's get specific. Um, Cause that, it just helps uh, move a project forward. Yeah, great. Thanks, Christy. So we have time for one question, which Laurel asks, through these findings, how have you, have you had any specific thoughts about how riparian plantings can be designed differently to better support bird habitat? So thanks, Laurel, for that question. Yeah, um, you know, it depends so much on where you are. And, 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 and I would say, again, what your goals are. So um, different species need different things. And uh, we often talk about focal species. So we'll, um, in the Central Valley, we have a suite of 12 focal species that we use for conservation planning. And the idea is that they represent uh, different habitat needs. They all have kind of different life histories. Some nests on the ground, some in shrubs, some in trees, some in cavities, some are migratory, some are not. Um, and some are associated with mature forest and some like that kind of early successional scrubby stuff um, and everything in between. So um, it really depends on what species you're targeting, but more and more we talk about restoring function and process so that you have, uh, you know, in your watershed, a mix of all of those things. And there's a regular cycle of, you know, flood or fire or disturbance that's kind of re continually renewing that, um, that habitat and creating a mosaic that can support all of them together. Uh, yeah. So it, kind of a non-answer, but um, all of the above. Yeah, so key. So, um, the mosaic of collaboration, ways to partner, of the work itself, of the, the habitat and plantings themselves too. So there are a few more questions and good conversation that's taking place in the chat. I want to make sure we have a good a chunk of time for our next panel. So let's please thank me, thank uh, Dr. Dabala for joining, join me in thanking her. So thanks everybody for uh, finding the reactions button there. Christy, if you're able to continue answering some questions in the chat roll, that would be great for a few minutes. Take a look. Yeah, great. thanks again. Thanks again for joining. So I want to ask folks to turn their cameras on for a minute. Amber is going to tee up this last panel, but if folks are in a place to turn their pan their camera on, that would be great. If you're not, that's okay. But I want to ask everybody, Amber, I'm going to jump ahead to this question for a minute. Um, to think about, so I see a couple cameras, not too many, but you know, scroll around, see who's in here. Again, if you're able to turn your camera on, that's great. What is the greatest gift or value that you can bring to a partnership? And you can do one of two things. You can either strike a pose and embody that, or you can write it in the chat roll. So what's the greatest gift or value that you can bring to a partnership? And what's a positive collaborative experience that have more than two partners? So Emily, if you'll put those questions in the chat roll, that would be great. So we're just getting your brain to think a little differently here. So you can either strike a pose. So I'm gonna strike a pose for collaborative as a circle. Anybody else wanna strike a pose? Probably not, but maybe so. Sally's stretching a little bit. Day is laughing, which is a great quality that Daya brings to projects. Gabriel has hands together. Laurel's contemplative, such a contemplative, thoughtful person. So we're going to invite you, Sally's stretching. 
uh, maybe a little bit there. Sometimes you do have to stretch yourself. So feel free to continue putting some, some responses to the chat roll to these two questions. What is your greatest gift and value that you can bring to a partnership? And then a collaborative experience that had more than two partners. I am so stoked for this panel in every way. And Amber, I'm going to turn it over to you to kick us off. And uh, I'd love to see the responses coming in here. And then we'll get rolling into it. So Amber, over to you. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, keep the gifts gifts rolling in there. All right, so this next uh, and final one we have is resilient collaboration, building authentic partnerships and leaning into your gifts. So um, as, as a collaboration and a collaborative, um, it's at its finest when people are each able to do what they do best, right? Um, we don't all have to do the same thing. It takes a village. And as we move into year four with the consortium, um, we want to ensure we have a resilient collaborative that's set up for the long term and continues to grow partnerships with um, new partners, but do so authentically and with intention. And we are super excited to hear from our very own facilitator, Christine, with Dialogue and Design today, um, Ruby Stimmel with Eco Latinos. Uh, Lucas Swamp Dog Tyree with Indieponics, who's also um, was one of our recipients of the consortium's mini grant this year. And um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Christine. Great. Thanks so much. So just briefly, you know, one of the things that, hang on one second here. When we talk about collaboration, you know, it, it's funny to be having situations, meeting online, because the full ability of our gifts to come together can't really quite manifest itself. So we have to find ways to adapt. And when we've looked broadly at what, um, what qualities or principles helps build community collaboration and resilience, these are the 10 principles we've identified to really help a community grow resilience. And we're going to focus in, I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes about how collaborative projects can be successful, how to build resilient collaborative projects. And a lot of it has to do with how to build community resilience. A lot of it has to do with looking up and looking out in the same way many of our speakers have talked today and Ruby and Luke are gonna speak in just a few minutes. You know, How do we honor the past, but plan for the future? How do we consider restoration and regeneration in our projects and our planning? How do we think as a region, not just an urban municipality, but rural neighborhoods that surround it? But when we look at the core of where resilience is built or where resilient collaboration can take place, resilience is built on the local ideas of local leaders. And I'll say this is true from a number of large scale collaborative um, projects that we've engaged in in the last 15 years at Dialogue and Design. And what we found time and time again is you have to have a place for those ideas to come together because resilience and success and challenges often has to be met in a place where folks can come together and share their ideas. And it needs to be grounded in local folks. And what I mean by local folks, that might be someone who moved to a community one month ago and says, this is where I am and I want to engage. That doesn't necessarily mean someone whose um, generations go back seven years, although it might, it might be seven generations. So it is people with grounded place, grounded site, grounded knowledge. So a couple factors, oh, so many words. Um, you know, Amber asked me to talk just a little bit about what makes a successful and resilient collaborative. So a couple things I wanna toss out. And these are a lot of things that the consortium's doing and some things we're not doing. We constantly look at, you know, where are we, where are we, you know, hitting some gaps? And uh, maybe, Emily, this is a good time to put our buffer summit evaluation link again in the chat roll and our overall consortium evaluation in the chat roll because we want to hear from people. How's it going for you? How's it looking? But successful collaboratives as a whole have a clear and transparent means for decision making and leadership. What we found time and time again is that consensus based decision making leads to more robust and inclusive decisions. Sometimes it takes more time, but as a whole, it's a lot more successful in the long run. Also, we heard this from Judy just a little bit ago, planning with the end in mind, beginning with the end in mind, and staying mindful of the mission, vision, and goals. So sometimes we check in, or our action groups might check in and say, hey, wait a minute, we're six months into this project. Are we still online with our vision and mission? 
welcoming new folks and sharing the story of the collaborative and what's the background and also celebrating leaders as they move on to new ventures because that takes place always folks need to move on to other things and that needs to be okay and we need to celebrate them for what they're able to contribute at the same time as we're looking at leadership as we're looking at how we're moving forward and planning looking at diverse long-term funding sources is key but driven again by the local ideas of local leaders so are the funding sources in line to support the vision and mission of the collaborative so that the heart of the intent of the collaborative is still there and then how can funding sources support that work and it's very much thinking of funding as watering or nutrients if you will to grow a collaborative that's really what the role of funding and the most successful long-term collaboratives look like but when you start to get into multiple years, three years, six years, what does that look like for long term? So looking at a sustainable organizational structure is key. Now that might be an anchor institution or an organization that can provide backbone support for long term. It might be a convener, it might be a facilitator, it might be um, an academic institution. But sometimes rotating leadership is key and also looking at how an organization might morph into different ways. It is often harder to receive funding for long term effort. So thinking about that from the beginning and many groups find that having staff support is key. And then also just keeping the momentum up, doing new activities and just having plain old fun is really key, shaking things up a little bit so folks don't get bored. Some people tend to get bored like myself more easily than others. So here's an example of the Clinch River Valley Initiative, which I facilitated with my dear friend and colleague, Frank Dukes of the Institute for Engagement and Negotiation in Southwest Virginia. Um, you'll see some similar themes of what builds a successful collaborative, but what I wanna draw your attention to here is tracking progress. There are five goals of this initiative and the collaborative was intentional about tracking progress over the five different goals. So you'll see things like, getting money for a new state park, which is now open. How many visitors came to a campground? How is water quality being improved? How many cleanups? So sharing progress is key. And again, having consensus-based decision-making. Getting ready to wrap up, thinking about our role as facilitators, um, listening first and deeply is key. Supporting the community and supporting the process and making sure that what we are doing is supporting what the collaborative uh, desires and the vision leads. Being willing to ask hard questions and you know stick through the conflict is also key. And and thinking about how to build in an exit strategy for long term collaboratives is also important. Um, it's also especially important to engage under engaged community members to create safe spaces for the community to gather across sectors, knowing that that's going to look different for different people. Cultivating leadership and trust, that takes a long time. You can't manufacture that. For real authentic collaboration to take place, it takes often years. And then to develop a consistent forum for community engagement. So I wanna wrap up with it. a link to podcasts we launched this year, the We Rise podcast, where you can hear more about collaboration and stories, yesweRise.org. And with that, you know, the space that we often hold is in hearing stories from other folks. So with that being said, that was kind of a quick overview of what collaboration can look like, but we want to look at how to lean into gifts and build authentic collaboration with Ruby and with Luke. Really think, thankful for both of you for joining us. Sierra is going to be sharing screens, and we're going to start out with Ruby first. So I will turn it over to you, Ruby, to introduce yourself, and here we go. And Ruby, we have your new slides in too, so thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, hi, I'm Ruby Stemley. I'm the founder and CEO of Eco Latinos. Uh, I'm, I'm born, I was born in Bogota, Colombia, and uh, I, but I've been in the metro DC area for about 25 years. But more, most of my career in the US has been doing Hispanic outreach. And my last job was working with the governor of Maryland doing a, as a director of the Governor's Commission on Hispanic Affairs. And so uh, after my service uh, uh, in public office, I, um, I um, um, political transitions uh, put me in a place where I felt that I needed to do something uh, different. And that was my opportunity to follow my dream and follow my passion for conservation and put and apply all the experience that I've had doing community, Latino community engagement. And, and that's how it's, uh, I started Eco Latinos. And um, so we do, and we can go to the next slide. 
Um, we, um, our mission is to empower the Latino community in the pursuit of social and environmental justice through engagement, education, and activism across the Chesapeake Bay. And that engagement, education, and activism are, are the three um, streams that we um, designated in our plan, strategic plan that we developed last year as the areas that we were gonna focus our work. Um, and uh, our, our, actually our vision is a world where Latinos leave the green fruit print on the earth. Um, next. So to address the issue of, in, of engaging new and underrepresented partners, I like to start sharing some key research-based information about Latinos and the environment. And I, I like to share this with every, in every presentation because a lot of people, uh, um, I think, welcome the information on those who, uh, if you have seen it, um, bear with me, it won't take long this time. So. Uh, one of the things that we that, that research have found and that evidence shows is that climate change and the environment are of greater concern to minorities than uh, non-minorities. So inclusion done effectively could be of a great, uh, you know, social and environmental justice value to environmental organizations. Uh, we we know that 60, according to to to, to the evidence, 68% uh, of minority voters poll free that uh, poll feel that climate change is an immediate problem. Latinos are more concerned with climate change than non-Latinos, which is curious information. Uh, but but even more cur curiouser is that Spanish language Latinos are even more concerned. And this has been found by the Yale uh, program on climate change communication. And another factor, the interesting factor is that environmental issues are as important as the passage of comprehensive on immigration reform for some, which is a huge, huge um, piece of information. We also know that minorities are disproportionately impacted by the burdens of climate change. And, and this is an even, even more significant reason to uh, address environmental issues with minorities um, because minorities are more exposed to air pollutants and, uh, and, and hazards or land uses. Um, we all know that there is less tree canopy in lower income neighborhoods and there is a higher vulnerability to health impacts from climate change. And you know, the greater migrations that we've seen more recently in, uh, to a great extent are being driven by uh, climate change. Um, so um, the, the, the most interesting thing uh, here that we found is that seven in 10 Latinos, however, all this information that I shared, we, it's been found that seven in 10 Latinos have never been contacted by an organization working to reduce global warming. And that is, I think, a very significant uh, finding because there is a great disconnect uh, between the high level of impact and and the ability of organizations to connect with the Latino communities and, and you know, uh, environmental organizations, we know continue to struggle to overcome barriers involving and engaging all the members of the community. And the reason for this may be that our communities are either not engaged effectively or not engaged at all. And to bridge that gap, it's important to be aware of the key barriers to engagement and principles for effective engagement. Um, next. Oh my gosh, I didn't say next. And I already went through all of this. <laughs> so we see the big gap. Sorry, I'm sorry, I should have uh, uh, remember. So, um, so, um, uh, talking about the, the big gap, um, um, we, how do we break those barriers? And in the case of the groups that I work with uh, is by practicing, and particularly I work with Latinos as a Latina is my community, I speak the language, I identify with the community. And so I have a little bit of, of things that I wanna share about uh, what has worked for us uh, in terms of getting the work done. 
Um, so practice, uh, pra practicing cultural competency is what I call the key, the key role. And to me, and that's to me, involves knowing the fabric of the community. How do you know the fabric of the community but meeting the community where the community is? Do maybe some research, you identify the community you wanna work with, but then, you know, make the effort to meet the community where they are. Don't expect the community to come to you. Don't expect to post a flyer and expect the community that come uh, to, to, to your programs um, by invitation um, only through whatever way you find to send the information. Building relationships. To build those relationships, we recommend to deploy community connectors, which should be um, people in your organization or, or not <laughs> that are familiar with the culture and the background of the community you wanna work with. And, um, and, and this is important to build this. I mean, people that are sensitive to the culture and the background of the community will help build these relationships of trust between your organization and the community. Next thing we recommend is aligning programs to the community priorities. So if, if, if the community you want to work with, you may find that the, the environmental pro, the environmental um, issue, the environmental issues are not a priority, although we already established that, that the, the community is highly impacted. Um, the programs, the community may have specific needs that don't necessarily match with the priorities or, or the environmental priorities. But aligning those programs to those priorities is, is critical. And once you identify the community priorities, you may want to come back to your plan and realign your goals to the community, to those community needs that you identify. So in all in, you know, it, it summarizes in, in you know, being sensitive to, to the community, the cultural, and language barriers, the socioeconomic status, the educational level of the community, all that will result in building a relationship of trust. Um, next. I said next <laughs> this time. So there are, there are challenges, uh, you know, uh, there are challenges in the way we all interact with the environment in, our own spaces. And uh, many Latinos live in apartment complexes and work at multiple jobs and shifts. So when they get the opportunity uh, to get out, they don't limit their experience to go and spend an hour at the park. But the family packs everything for a full day of fun. And everybody, the children, grandchildren, grandparents, and nephews, and everybody gets together at the park. And with that come a load of <laughs> equipment, right? And uh, bring the barbecuing and all the materials for barbecuing and toys and hammocks and all sorts of things that, that make that experience an enjoyable one. In the meantime, the typical American, when they go to the park, they go with a set, an idea in mind of what they are gonna do at the park. We're gonna go for one hour and it's one hour, you know, check the time when you get in there. And, and in an hour, you know, we have to be out of here because we are, you know, um, very tied to our schedules and our plans. Same thing happens uh, often when we do activities like community or river cleanups. The, the, community gets to the cleanup with the entire family, the stroller, you know, and while mom pushes the stroller, that, that goes into, you know, does the job of picking up the trash. So it is a different interaction that you find that Latinos have in, when, you know, when, when doing the type of work that, that environmental organizations do. So, you know, one of the issues with this is that in, in very often organizations and and even you know parks feel that Latinos are not using the park the, the public spaces appropriately, right? But it may be that 
what happened and, and Latinos feel that there are not sufficient, there is no sufficient infrastructure for them to enjoy. So Latinos feel sometimes that the bathrooms at the uh, you know, at the park are not sufficient or large enough, or if there is a, is a beach, there are not enough showers. But it is because the infrastructure was not built for this type of use. So we need to just to consider, you know, increasing that, you know, infrastructure, if I may call it that way. So we, you know, uh, align, you know, our services to the community needs. There is no point in opposing, you know, the idea that Latinos should not go to the park and stay the entire day. You're not going to change that. It's never going to change. It's going to be even more. It's going to happen even more frequent. So that's where, where you know, it comes, you know, back to the previous slide when we were talking about adapting. Uh, next. So. You have heard, and I, you know, many times we repeat that translating a flyer or a website may not be all it needs to be done to communicate with people of diverse backgrounds. And that is true, but the issue may be bigger than that. Sometimes we find ourselves not speaking the same language, even if we're speaking English. And we make, make assumptions about receptivity of the message. You know, and so we tend to produce information uh, about the programs or try to uh, reach out to the community to certain flyers or pages of policy, you know, concepts on how we got to the idea of doing this project with the community. And it may be that that's just not the way the community is going to get it. Nobody has the time to read the pages, you know, and again, talking about cultural being culturally sensitive and sensitive to the level of literacy of the community you know that might not be so you may not want to waste money by translating policy that you want to put to the community because it's not going to do any good you may want to think about how you're going to put your ideas and concepts and summarize them in a way that is clear and understandable and maybe even using figures like the way I'm doing in this, in this uh, presentation. Ruby, one more um, minute. One more minute. Oops, okay, almost done there. So the other point is the expectations and requirements. Being prepared to find that some on the community may not be able to meet certain requirements that can be you know, removed. So when you, you set the rules on how you can participate in this program, you re you're required to have this, this, and that for, for us to be able to you know, give you the program. Well, maybe that is not the way it should be said. You have to review the way you plan your program so it fits the specific profile of the community. And I, I think that, you know, I guess I'll have to finish now, but you know, the idea I like to give you another fun idea, I mean, um, experience, but maybe we can talk about it later. So it takes time. This is a process that takes time. So please don't worry, it doesn't happen overnight. There are a lot of things that that can you know that 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 need to happen before you can you can get to the point where you feel that your relationship with underserved and the represented community is successful. But you know, just keep in mind the community readiness versus the organizational goals. And at the end, our goal for Eco Latinos is not to build a program but build a system of healthy relationships, and the success of the program is the reward. Great. Ruby, how can folks find, find you, find your information or learn more about your work? Yeah, thank you for, I love that you asked that question. Yeah, well, um, um, I can put on the chat my email address and, um, and the website for Eco Latinos, and I hope um, to hear from you all. We love to partner with organizations. That's actually how we do our work is by partnering with organizations that don't have the field, they have the the, the capacity to serve uh, certain communities and we specialize in and we as Latinos do the Latino engagement for you know potential organizations that been you know wanna do this and I, I highly recommend that let's do it. <laughs> it has to be done. Great. Well thank thank you so much Ruby everyone please join me and thank you Ruby for a great presentation across the board. So thank you. There's a link to Equal Latinos in the chat role and Ruby's email address. So thanks so much, Ruby.
Well, Luke, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Ruby. Lucas, we're so excited to hear about ND Ponics. And Luke, I'll turn it over to you for a presentation. So thanks again, Ruby. And Luke, over to you. Sure. So uh, you can just go through the slides uh, as you see fit. They're just pictures of basically the site where we're at. So a uh, brief background is Indiponics is an indigenous-led fund in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. We have purchased lands that belonged to the Yesa people, uh, Eastern Siouan linguistic people, to which I'm a member, uh, the Monacan Indian Nation, the Halawa Saponi, Saponi of Ohio, um, and these people, Nansen, uh, sorry, the, uh, the other groups that we work with within the Algonquin community as well. But we have, we started with basically a mountain um, that my fifth great grandfathers joined the War of 1812 when the British and the Americans were asking for indigenous people to join one side or the other in exchange for land grants with the thought process being that they really could care less which side won. They were just looking to get the land into some kind of legal title so the history of land ownership in Virginia is similar to the rest of the country, but uh, my family was in this valley dating back before colonization and then post-colonization. In this picture here, actually the two mountains nearest uh, in this picture are actually two mountains we've purchased back. Uh, we've purchased, we're working on close to 500 acres all in working with landowners to put conservation easements, actual land purchases. And uh, basically this land grant that my fifth great grandfather got was for 500 acres. And so the original intent was to retrieve the 500 acres, uh, make up for the fact that amount of it was taken by US Forest Service and amount of it was taken through intimidation, uh, racial violence uh, throughout the valley. Um, from first-hand accounts and from um, eyewitness testimony that we've gathered over time, the land was taken by forest through clan members who used to shoot into houses, shoot the livestock, uh, and run indigenous and black members of the community out. Um, most of our work focuses on this, getting this land back, allowing us to do indigenous permaculture. I've been, I thought about the question that was asked. I started planting forest before I could walk. Uh, because when I was young, when I first started eating solid food, they gave me huckleberries and raspberries and blackberries, and wherever I went to the bathroom, that's where they grew. So I guess I started at that age. Uh, this picture here is of Eastern Brook Trout we have on our stream. We own about two miles of cold water streams, and that's what we got funded from uh, James River to be able to uh, protect the buffer there. We have intact forests, maybe 50, 60 acres. We've, we control our old growth pre-Columbian contact forests. They've never been logged. Some of them were only, some of the other lands we have were logged by horse and buggy and only for American chestnut. So you have several hundred year old trees. So in the context of what is an intact forest, I have everything from riparian buffer that has only been changed by hurricane events and flooding events. There's never been any cutting all the way to what once was a field. And so I'm a strong proponent of using native seed stock from site location. Uh, this is a picture of another effort we're doing. There's a power line that comes to the valley that was taken, easements for the power line were taken from the landowners because they were poor, they were people of color, they were taken without pay. And so they're not, they're just prescriptive easements, but they are in fact, so uh, the efforts we've done so far have taken down a half mile of line uh, underground at the VDOT right of way, which allowed four riparian, uh, I guess, corridors of 40 feet each to regrow. We remove the invasive species, we utilize native seed stock, and then we allow it to do natural progression. Uh, as far as longevity for institution, I'll pass on this nonprofit to my children and to their children and on down the line as long as we exist. Uh, so the institutional memory, say for this land here, this was cleared by the tribe. 
it stayed in tribal members' hands up until some of them were run out. Uh, the mountain in the background in this picture actually to the left and the right is lands that Indiponics has purchased. The mountain to the right was owned by a tribal member uh, who, after his family was forced out, he, the truth is he was sentenced to life in prison for murder, a double homicide that was racially motivated. Uh, two men who were not active clan members, but associates, they assaulted his family and he took retribution. So he's currently in prison, but he held on to the land, even though the county commissioner and the commissioner of revenue uh, and county administrator, they worked together to uh, put a suit to try to take the land due to failure to pay taxes. He had paid the taxes from prison. He was able to maintain ownership file the court case from prison and actually win the case to retain his land to prove that he had paid for it. So the land tenureship that we're looking at is tumultuous to say the least. And so on these lands, we have about 15 springs that we manage. And by manage, what I mean is traditionally uh, the way the forest is managed is if a tree is destroyed in a storm, a fire, natural lightning strike, disease, insect infestation as they die. The cultivation is based off of that gap in the canopy, deciding which species you're allowed to grow and which species you harvest for other uses. So a lot of the understory in this forest is pawpaw. A lot of the overstory in the old fields that were burned uh, after the cultivation is finished, they become uh, butternut and black walnut. Uh, this is another picture of the lion actually going over the creek. Uh, basically, the, the concept here is a very site-specific area. We have 30,000 acres that has 90 landowners. The vast majority of it is either owned by wealthy people who basically use it for weekends, excursions to ride horses, the U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Park Service, and uh, a number of small land holdings. So we work with Virginia Doors Foundation to help other landowners to put their land under easement and to assist us in the process. This is a picture of one of the old growth uh, red oaks we have on the properties. Um, these forests were maintained through a level of dedication that has, has cost members of my own family their life. It has cost uh, members of the community everything they have. Most of the people who protected lands in general uh, in this valley have had to really sacrifice most everything else. So what we've aimed to do with Indiponics is to enable landowners to actually protect their lands without it being such a financial burden that it, it crushes them. Um, with grant funding through VOF, we uh, were able to protect 200 acres of land from landowners who could not otherwise afford to do this. The extra monies from the grant went towards paying medical bills, health bills, People ask these landowners why they didn't cut their trees. And the only reason they had behind it was the fact that the trees were more valuable than themselves. So most of my work is very site specific. We have far ranging impacts because we control so much water in this, uh, in this valley, which contributes directly to Irish Creek, South River, Maury River, James River, Chesapeake Bay is where it goes, but I'm usually better at answering questions than at doing presentations. So I'm happy to answer questions. Great, thanks so much, Luke, appreciate it. So let's uh, thank Luke for our presentation, a great presentation across the board. And Sarah, you can go ahead and stop sharing the slides. So um, relationship to place, you know, what does it take to, to steward a place to hold on to trees that someone loves, building connection and community, a lot of themes between what Ruby and Luke have shared. To open it up for questions. We have just a minute or two from questions for folks. I don't see any in the chat roll, but folks are welcome to take themselves off mute and ask any questions if, if you have them. And if not, we have a, a question to ask. So Ruby and Luke, could you know either or both of you talk a little bit about what you see? You know, you've heard a little bit about the consortium and 
Could you talk just a little bit, you know, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here about what you might say to, you know, how do collaborative groups need to morph to be more, um, for folks to be able to lean into their gifts more within a collaborative? Does that make sense in terms of my question? Like, how does a collaborative group need to be able to shift to either be more welcoming, engaging, to be able to make it known? Like, how does a person keep land in their family or for generations? So what, what words of wisdom would you offer the consortium, if any, or just for other community partners? Big question. You can go first, Ruby. <laughs> okay. Look. Well, I'm, 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 I don't know what to, what to tell you. I mean, there is so much that needs to be done for organizations to be able to, to, you know, do this work. Um, I don't know. I, I'm thinking the first thing that came to my mind may not be the line of, uh, of the idea you, you had, but organizations need to expand the diversity of their, you know, of their teams. And um, I think that um, when there isn't anybody at the table that represent the underrepresented, you know, communities, uh, it's very easy that the issues are not addressed and they, you know, nothing, nothing happens, nothing, you know, and, and, and I'm not saying it's like, it's, it's, it's neglect. But it's, there is a little bit of like shyness about it. You know, how do we do this? It's a little, I've noticed that a little bit of fear, you know, how do I go to this community? I don't speak the language, right? So I, as I was saying in the presentation, um, you know, really we are all the same, but I mean, just going, delivering, sending your, you know, your, your team and, and develop those relationships with the community. Uh, go to when you go to the community where the community where where people are, you know, like go through organizations like or, or like institutions or places where like the places of worship is a great place to establish relationships. Uh, you can go to the leadership of these, you know, churches, and they are eager because also there is this strong connection between a uh, you know environment and the spiritual uh, beliefs, and so. Um, I think that that is a great way to get started, you know, going to churches and, and you know, offer the church. And there are many churches today with huge, um, uh, you know, like Latino congregations or, you know, underrepresented groups, like specifically with the Spanish, for example, in, and that's my area, sorry. I don't mean to not acknowledge everybody else, but, uh, you know, many churches are offering the, the services in Spanish. And so mm -hmm. you just, the way we do it, we just go to the Spanish, uh, you know, congregation. We sign up people, we tell them what we do. People love it, the people sign up and you start building the relationship that way. You may not build it through emails. You may have to use text. That's for example, another way that works. You're not gonna get much response through emails, mm -hmm. and so it's start kind of. It's almost like a personal relationship. But I tell you, it's a lot of fun at the end. Yeah. It works. I love that, Ruby, and and that needs to be different. It needs to be okay to ask hard questions and to create space, engaging the places of worship. So key. Thanks, Ruby. Luke, feel free to um, answer the question. My roundabout question, or Amber has put a question for you in the chat role too. I remember being inspired by our talk about your approach to riparian buffer restoration. Can you share a little bit about that, particularly around the zones for people versus the stream? Sure. So a lot of our approach to uh, reforestation, uh, fire management, uh, forest management in riparian buffers is similar in that if you have to heavily manage something, it's not sustainable long term. By long term, I mean in the hundreds of years since. Uh, so when we talk about a mature forest, I mean something that's at least two, three hundred years old. Anything younger than that is still a regenerating forest. And as far as the soil content is, it's still regenerating. So uh, for me, a person can walk in and look from their point of view. If you live in a city and you go out and you do this work, you know, several hours a week, every month or so versus you actually live there every day of your life, you have a better concept. But in reality, the forest has its own concept. If there is a seed that falls onto the ground in a riparian buffer, the seed that was meant to live is the seed that doesn't get washed away when the waters get up, 
it doesn't get washed away when the soil underneath it has a problem. You don't know unless you have geologic data to say if you're planting on top of a boulder um, from the mountains. So this is the way it works for us. Maybe two feet down is good, but for me, if I plant an acorn, I consider, well, in those old growth forests, I've seen trees that were hundreds of years old when you do the tree core data after they die, but they grew down, their roots grew around a boulder, and when the boulder shifted, they fell down. So the long-term approach to me is to naturally let it recover. If invasive species are not in your cards, then you remove them. But I've I spent time in Hawaii with uh, in Hawaiian homelands, and there's a debate about invasive species, in all honesty, about what actually is invasive. If you consider how far back just my own lineage goes on this continent, I could guarantee we've brought a lot of invasive species here from all over the world uh, long before Europeans ever set foot here. So the forest finds an equilibrium. But when you try to manage it from the point of view of somebody who's not living in the space, then you're managing it from a point of view that doesn't come from that place. If you're in that place and you're providing food for yourself as a creature of the place, then that's your purpose. And you can acknowledge that. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's better for birds, amphibians, reptiles, and so on. But the religion that I followed since I was a child, once I translated into science, which is basically just a language, is that... You increase biodiversity, you increase carrying capacity, and you increase your own quality of life. And those other two should be part of your quality of life. So when you replant a riparian buffer, the question I would have is what seed was already in the ground? If you can stop, this is similar to getting BIPOC people involved in natural sciences and in these organizations. If you can remove the buffers, so the barriers to natural progression, It'll find a way. Trying to prop up and to create artificially an equilibrium that is changing, I don't see how it can be done. I've, I've lived it and it's been passed down from generation to generation and not any of the writings that any of my great grandparents put down, nothing that I was taught said that you can manipulate an environment the way you want it to be and plant your trees every 10 and a half feet and use this 10 species because they're shown to have bigger root balls than the other and they have shallow root systems and we put tap roots here and so on and we we designed it and then you find out that oh well we planted a whole the state department tried that with kutsu and they tried that with ailanthus and they tried that with uh russian olive and they tried it with then they tried it with native species so they went to green ash and then oh emerald ash borer and then it's over so you can't know what it's going to be. In all honesty, the, the resilience that is what I was taught as an indigenous person is the resilience of change. You mm -hmm. have to roll with the punches. So I think the landscapes can do that. No matter how much they've been denuded, there's still seed, seed, uh, seed stock in the ground. So the question is, how much oversight do you need? Really, I think that the biggest landscape change needs to be those things that suppress the natural growth need to be removed mm -hmm. the power lines are removed in that valley mm -hmm. we're already seeing 15 foot tall uh sycamore trees coming off of stumps they're coming off of stumps they'll grow up i've seen water sprouts before you know for 20 years watch the same water sprout eventually it'll break off because it's coming from a stump that's rotting so it'll let something else grow up in its shadow in the meantime mm -hmm. you just have to have a far far side of it you know 120 years from now 200 years from now you know however many staff turnovers that is for u.s forest service and hey, vof and JRS. right right great i love that that long-term springboarding what does it look like what is there and being able to roll with the punches and and what does that look like so thank you so much ruby thank you so much luke let's thank our presenters again there's so much there that we could um use as guidance for moving forward. So thank you all. So to wrap up, um, Emily, if you'll pop those links in the chat roll again, thank you. We invite you to fill out an evaluation for the consortium as a whole as well for the Buffer Summit. You can join the email list at jamesriverconsortium.org. Um, we thank all of you for joining today for your time. And there is so much happening throughout the watershed. So there's an events calendar on the webpage. You can stay informed. And we also have a newsletter. So thanks everyone for joining today. Amber, words to close us out today? 
Just thank you. I know we're over time. I appreciate it. Um, hopefully we see some of you in person. And Luke, I'm hoping to get up to the Upper James at some point to see all the awesome work you're doing up there and visit some of those old growth forests and maybe hug that big red oak that you shared a photo of. So we, yeah, thanks everyone. We look forward to continuing the conversation with Ruby and other presenters as well. Luke, um, d, d team, Leah, Sierra, Emily, thanks so much for all you've done. And thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.